Welcome, 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 geeks and nerds, girls and boys, to a brand new edition of geek to me Radio. Tonight, we have actor Teo Penglis on talking about a brand new podcast he's got called The Lost Treasures that explores history. Later on, we'll talk with actress Sophia Lillis about a new movie she's got out called The Adults, opposite Michael Sarah. All that and more, please stand by. We're talking TV, comics and movies, and video games. Star Trek from Star Wars will try to explain The Andrew Dodgers for Hogwarts houses on Ring Rolls and Mall To be the greatest Pokemon master You must catch them all You must catch them all Try to catch them all Gotta catch And if you're driving around the greater St. Louis area tonight listening to us on the Big 550 KTRS, hello to all of you. Thank you for tuning in on this kind of odd weathered Sunday night. A little bit of rain, a little bit of sun. Uh, if you're streaming us out there on the app or on the website, hello to all of you. Thank you very much for tuning in there. And of course, as always, if you're hearing us after the fact in the podcast form on whatever platform you get your podcasts, iHeartRadio, Google Play, whatever it may be. We do appreciate you finding us there, subscribing and checking us out. No video tonight. My executive producer, Joey V, is out this evening, so it'll just be old school radio only, just the audio. But that won't stop us. We've got a great show, two fantastic guests, and we're going to go to my first guest right now, Teo Penglis. You'll know him from his roles on Mission Impossible, the TV series, as Nicholas Black, Victor Cassidy on General Hospital, Tony DeMera on Days of Our Lives, so many more favorite TV series of mine, Heart to Heart, Magnum P.I., and Who's the Boss that he's shown up on. He joins us live right now. Teo, thanks for your time tonight. Ah, thank you. It's a pleasure to come on board on a course. Sunday evening. Yes, yeah, that's right. It's, it's, um, it's, it's great to have you. You're, uh, it's, it's odd that I'm... I've seen so much daytime TV growing up. My grandmother moved in with us uh, when I was very young, and she had to watch her stories. So I, I grew up watching a lot of these, and you were on there. Uh, I came in right about the time that you had the triangle going on with John and Kristen. It was about the time I started watching. Oh, I see. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, it was, it's been 40 years since I've been on uh, daytime Um it's nothing, you know, it was really by by mistake uh, because it was a strike, which is what we're going through now. But we had this uh, nine-month strike, and I had just finished a film called Altered States with Ken Russell, and the only work available was daytime, and that's how it all started. And going strong over, I cannot believe this, I looked it up on IMDb, over 1,500 episodes of Days of Our Lives. That, that seems impressive. Could you imagine when they opened my brain and analyze it and think what the hell did this man think about <laughs> now it's uh yes it's 1500 shows it, it, you know it's one of the toughest uh in the acting field i think at least when you're doing theater you do you learn the play and that's what you do when you do a series you have six days to shoot it but we're doing you know sometimes two shows a day and to learn that kind of dialogue uh overnight is 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 tough because you never get quite to the performance. You always just get to the edge and there's no time for criticisms or you just go on to the next. So it's, um, it's, to me, it's the actors who are kind of warriors in the field because they get, uh, less accoladed, I think. And, um, it's more work, more difficult work, and the pressure is really on. Whereas film and nighttime TV, as difficult as some of those scenes can be, they don't, we don't have that kind of luxury. And I've spoken with veterans like Peter Reckel. We've had newer people like uh, like Eric Martzoff has been on the on the show talking about Days of Our Lives. And it's interesting, every single actor I've talked to who has that daytime background said 
A, it's like a crucible. You kind of need to be at the top of your game. And also, for new actors, it's a great learning program because it really gets a lot of those skills that you've got to have to form a strong foundation underneath you. Yes, when I finally went into nighttime, one of the things the directors used to ask me, where did I get my training? Because, you know, most of the time they don't direct. You know, they they, they just push the cameras but when you're working in daytime, um, and then when I went into nighttime, the whole idea was how to direct yourself. And so you you smartly know how to control the camera. So if the director is not directing you specifically, you make the moves. The camera has to follow those moves. So that makes you in control of the scene. And there is such, like you mentioned, that tight turnaround. Uh, but I, I would think, though, being on a show as long as Days of Our Lives, for example, you've got some really great friendships that have come out of it, I'm sure. Not really. No, <laughs> <laughs> you've shattered my image now. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, last night I had a big dinner party because I love to cook, and I had my friend Lauren uh, Coslow and Leanne Hunley here uh, for dinner. Uh, but yes, you know, it's Listen, you see people inside and out, you know, you learn about their habits, those who want to be divas and uh, hard to control, and there's those who come in and just want to do the work. And uh, and those are the ones who remain to me, the professionals uh, who have longevity in daytime. Uh, and also because you have a character that is able to to have the, the audience uh, fall in love with or like because there's something about you that is still ongoing, that there's a sense of mystery, there's a sense of an attraction, whatever that may be. It's the chemistry with the audience. And if you're lucky enough and you do it well enough, they'll follow you. Um, and that's why some actors are short-lived and others have longevity, and that's why they're called Svets. And with uh, the work you've done on Days of Our Lives, all the storylines you've been involved in, I'm not sure if it's a fair question, but do you have a favorite storyline? There was a particular story that you really enjoyed more than another one. Was it as Andre? Was it as Tony? Was it with a certain actor that made it special? Something like that? Um, well, as far as the love stories are concerned, uh, that, that's with Leanne Hunley. I mean, there aren't couples that last 40 years, and we have. And the beauty about that is because we have we resonate as friends as well, mm. and we support each other. Same with Lauren Cosler and Deidre Hall. They're, they're actors I've always enjoyed working with. But um, as far as a favorite story, uh, you know, they've killed me seven times. Right. You know, <laughs> how do I love their stories? Um, it's it's always a tragedy. You know, I sometimes I wish they'd just send me upstairs like they have with actors in the past and they never came down. <laughs> but I think now, um, no, it's. Um, Probably the scenes I did with the late Joe Moscola, who played my father. Oh, we sure. started the Demera family, and, and uh, he was a real pro and a powerful character and, and also powerful within, and, and we resonated because we came from the same acting classes. That, that work with him uh, has always been very fruitful, and um, you, know, you can never quite trust sometimes because sometimes if, if I use a tone that he may not like, he may turn around and slap me just like because he believes in the character and the s sequence. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it, they're so fast. You, you know, a, a, the, the enjoyment you get is when you're driving home and you're thinking, okay, that went well, but now you're thinking about tomorrow's line. So you don't get a, a lot of time to enjoy the situation. That's why sometimes I don't quite remember the scenes that people ha uh, will put on, on social media. I go, mm -hmm. oh, my God, I can't even remember that. But <laughs> But, you know, the, the thing, the great thing about that was the journeys I was able to take. The, you know, the dream I had coming from Australia was I don't know where I'm going to make money, but I'm going to find a career and try to be successful. And out of that, take that money and take my journeys and educate myself about other cultures. And that's what I did. And that's what this podcast uh, has become. It is a, it's, a, it's the search, well, the search within your heart about your own identity um, it's why things resonated with me about other cultures because they did things I, I never understood before. And, and by being with them, living with them, eating their foods and celebrating with them, I learned about how other people lived. And so it made my life that much richer. So I found myself loving um, 
ancient heroes because it's very hard to find heroes today. You know, yeah. we have so many, I mean, our politicians are just so disappointing because you can't trust anybody anymore. And it becomes like, so, you know, in your own search, you realize every individual has to face his own criteria about what he contributed and in life. And I just feel like there's a lot of people who just lie. You know, when we grew up, and I'm sure with you, our families, you were told the truth. You know, you don't, you only lie and then you lie and then it's always different you tell the truth but once and so you know and if you and if you didn't tell the truth you'd be physically hurt in some way or you'd be reprimanded embarrassed but you know so i'm my journey and my podcast is about searching the truth and so it's it's what i call the ithaca within me which is what happens when you end your journey what is it that you look back at in your life that, that is worth celebrating. And so I found that cooking and entertaining was a way of celebrating life with my friends. And um, because I, I don't have to, I, I, I'm still discovering, as we all do, but sometimes some people, they reach their 60s and they realize they didn't discover very much because they didn't go too far within. Mm. And that's what we're having problems with during COVID. People had to go within and found out there were things they didn't like about themselves. So to me, it's, it's about exploring people who did things well and people who have remained enigmas their entire history, even if it's for 1,000, 5,000 years. There's something in it. So that's why treasures for me are, or are how people found things within the earth that unraveled certain parts of history that put myths into the front pages and made them real. And that's what my first podcast is about, is how a man called Onrik Schliemann, who became the father of archaeology in the 19th century, and how he found, uh, by following Homer's Iliad and Homer's Odyssey, he found the truth and then uncovered it in a place called Hizalik in, in Turkey. And he, he brought up a treasure that was extraordinary, which ended up being given to Germany, which was then stolen by the Russians and disappeared until 1994. The second one is about the great uh, discovery in Mycenae, where the Trojan War started, uh, with Agamemnon and the gold he, un he discovered, and also the curse that I think he, he unleashed. The third is about going through with an archaeologist and scholar, John Crawshaw, who I flew to meet in, in, um, in Greece last year. And he showed me the new discoveries and where the real island of Ithaca is, where Ulysses' home was. And so I, I had a fantastic trek climbing up and down the mountain looking at these ancient sites. And wow. those are the things some people, you know, I don't understand why people don't like. Some people don't like history. They didn't even care what happened five years ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I've always been a history buff. Um, I, I, it's, it's fascinating, too. And again, for those of you who just not, now might be tuning in, we're talking with Teo Penglis about his podcast, The Lost Treasures, uh, exploring the Iliad, the Odyssey through the amazing life of German archaeologist Heinrich Schleimann. Uh, are you OK to stick with me through a commercial break real quick? Absolutely. Perfect. We're going to take a quick pause. We're going to come right back in just one moment. We'll chat more about Teo's podcast and more. You're listening to geek to me Radio on the Big 550 KTRS. Please stand by. Hi, this is John Delancey, and you're listening to geek to me Radio. We are back. geek to me Radio heard here on the Big 550 every Sunday night, 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. I want to make sure we tell you about our premier sponsor, the Greater St. Charles Convention and Visitors Bureau. If you go to the website, discoverstcharles.com, may not be ancient Greek history, but you can learn a lot about history from the website and from the area itself. It's the oldest settlement west of the Mississippi. They've got a lot of uh, old historic buildings and markers. So if you're a history buff like Teo and I, you can go check all that out. If you're a foodie, my goodness, there are so many great places to eat up and down North and South Main Street in the surrounding area. Little shops and restaurants all over this area. And of course, they're all small businesses. I always implore you to support small businesses whenever you can. And that's what this entire area is made up of. A lot of cool things going on. They've got their huge festivals coming up here. Uh, Legends and Lanterns in the fall. And of course, Christmas trip 
traditions in December. Always something going on, whether you're from out of town, whether you're local and want to check out someplace new you haven't visited yet, may I recommend the City of St. Charles. The Greater St. Charles Convention and Visitors Bureau has been our official sponsor since the very beginning, seven years ago, that we've been doing this radio show now. Check out the website, Discover. StCharles.com. Again, that's discoverSTCharles.com. As we always say, it's an historically good time. Chatting with Teo Planglis about his brand new podcast, The Lost Treasures. Um, we talked about history right before we went to break there. And like you said, some people tend to not care even about things that happened five years ago, but I've always been fascinated by history, especially Greek mythology and, and those stories and everything like that. When when you're exploring things like that and starting this podcast, where did you even think to start? There's so many different ways you could have gone. Um, it was interesting. I was uh, There was a book written uh, in the 70s called The Greek Treasure, which was really about Schliemann finding his wife in Greece and exploring Troy. And when I read that book, I thought, wow, that's an interesting tale. So I went, when I went to Athens, I went to visit his uh, burial site, which is a, a miniature Parthenon and um, with a bronze door with, and a relief all the way around it, describing and showing how he had accomplished his discoveries. And then I went to the Greek Museum, uh, the Archaeological Museum, and a man recognized me there from Mission Impossible, and he came from around his <laughs> Count the counter and he embraced me and um, and he said, you know, you've given us so much pleasure, we Greeks. And he says, what can I do for you? I said, call the Minister of Culture for me. I'd like to, I'd like to meet with him. There's some questions I'd like to ask. And so he allowed me, <clears throat> he called and I had an appointment the next day. And when I met the Minister of Culture, he get, got me permission to enter Schliemann's magnificent mansion in Athens. And then I told him I had visited his site and there were flowers in front of his gravesite. And I thought, you know, a hundred odd years later, people are still thinking of him. So mm. he did accomplish a lot. But what happened next was I was allowed to go through 60,000 documents in the Gennadius Library mm. in Athens. And uh, you would see Amer- American school there. And uh, I spent two weeks going through all these documents. Then I went to visit Troy. And like everything that you do as an actor, to, for me, is you try to be thorough about how do you build your foundation? What kind of a character are we dealing with? And um, and so because of that, I was able to kind of dissect and study his his diaries, his um, his letters to his wife, uh, clippings from newspapers who told that he was a fake, that, you know, what he found, the treasure, that he put it there himself. You know, they never wanted, like today, you know, you look at Biden, you see his accomplishments, no one wants to acknowledge, a lot of people don't want to acknowledge and they don't even want to know. And and I don't know why we put people down all the time. Uh, it's something that is so universal is that when people have accomplished great things, there's always going to be someone who's going to come around and pull them down and, and, and chip at the statue. I grew up with that uh, philosophy in Australia called called uh, the white uh, the po- tall poppy syndrome you get too tall we shoot you down and so i wanted to explore a man who was truly harassed in his in the 19th century and so when i put it all together i thought hmm this will this will be a good story to tell an audience who wants to know because here i was a modern man walking in a, uh, the ancient road and i found that to be fascinating and someone said you know, if you're looking for rocks, you find them everywhere. Well, you pick up a rock, and if you have an imagination, you can uh, sort of look at a piece of marble or a piece of chard and wonder who was the person who created this and how long ago. And we're talking thousands of years old. Yeah. You know, you sit on the, on the site of Troy, and you look out at that road, and that's where the great war took place between the Greeks and the Romans. And you think, you know, the imagination soars. And that's why I say to people, don't shortchange yourself. Don't shortchange your mind. Fill it up with such incredible beauty and knowledge. And that's what makes you feel great when you get older, because you've built a foundation, just like you build a foundation as an actor. You build a foundation as a character of yourself, so that when people meet you, they see something. They don't look past you, they look at you. When you speak, they listen. But if you don't, <clears throat> if you want to hold an audience, you know, sometimes there are great men who can be silent and they're intriguing. And so I say to myself, who am I and what have I achieved? And why not talk about a life well lived? 
And that's what made me go into, because I've been on some dangerous journeys. I've been arrested. I've been, you know, secret police trying to arrest me. I've had kidnapping uh, at the pyramids at night. I mean, I've been through a lot of things, but I always survived because I had my mind intact. Mm. And I always had, and by doing that, the one thing I learned from Schliemann is how do you sharpen your tools? How do you know who's in front of you, who's behind you, who just left you? How do you understand the the cycle of life and how, and what kind of a journey are you taking? And so, you know, when I see people uh, at restaurants with their children and phones, I think you are missing opportunities here because at that age, they need to be disciplined. At that age, they need to understand that the food in front of them is to represent a celebration of their life. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's well said. We've got uh, one of our texts came in. We've got Marianne listening from Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Hello, Marianne. She wants to know, Teo, what culture in your many journeys have you found to be the most fascinating? Egyptian. Hmm. And hello, Marianne. Um, Yeah, Egyptian, because it doesn't matter how many times you look at their hieroglyphs. I mean, it took them 1,500 years to be able to decipher the hieroglyphs. But no matter what you see, you never quite understand it because it's an enigma. And, uh, I mean, I love my Greek heritage, don't get me wrong. But, you know, Egypt has a calling for me that uh, makes me weep because it is so magnificent and what they contributed to our world and still with the uncoverings that they've made. I mean, you know, even on Netflix, there's one called The Lost Pyramid, even though I'm not crazy about this, uh, the archaeologist Hawass, because I've met him a number of times. He's just a rude son of a bitch. But Ooh. anyway, um, <laughs> but, but the story's great. I mean, he's contributed a lot for Egypt, you know. He's just not a particularly... Um, I'm, I'm just not crazy about that human being, but Egypt is magnificent, and, and it's people too. I mean, it's a wonderful race of people, and they've got a lot of things to be proud of. You know, here we're a young country; we don't have a lot of history. But uh, you know, even the 300 years of history that we have, people lie about it now. We can't even we can't even uh, accept the fact that you know the black history in this country. I mean, it's just like I'm saying: what, what are you telling your your youth? You know. Even though it, it was an abysmal piece of history, we learned from it, you know, and we gave, we gave these people, you know, they came from royal households in Africa. I mean, these people have an amazing uh, culture, and, and we're trying to disown it. So I don't understand that because I think, I think we're being threatened because the country's changing. Well, welcome to the world. I mean, that's what happens. That's what his, why history keeps turning, because it's change. It's interesting because with the rise of social media where people can just go online and Google anything they want, you would think we'd have a more learned society, especially when it comes to history. We'd have a more, I don't want to say a more tolerant society because there's intolerant people everywhere, but it would—it seems like it's had just the opposite effect in the past 20, 30 years uh, since the advent of the Internet. It's almost uh, gotten somehow in a more sorry state. Do you feel similarly? Yeah, listen, I I left Australia because I was an immigration official and I didn't like the way Europeans were being treated. I wanted to be somewhere where Europeans would be welcome into a country, just like everybody else whose ancestry immigrated to this great country. There's a reason why other cultures have mixed well and we learn about their culture, their food, their, their dress sense, their minds. You know, it's all part of the educational system. But when people get into fear factors or they want to create the fear... They, they will start telling lies to people, and, and people are gullible because they don't do their homework. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and there's and also, so much to appreciate. You know, it just, it just riles me. You know, um, well, you know, even when I went to Syria, I, 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 just before the war started there in 2011, I went to Syria. They spat in my face when I had an American passport. Oh, my gosh. And they said, persona non grata. And they wanted to know what I was doing in Syria. I said, I wanted to learn and, and, and study your history. They said, what history? I said, the history before you. And that's when they spat. Because oh the history before them was not Muslim. The history before them, you know, they didn't invade until the 7th century. The history before them were Greeks and Romans. I mean, you know, that's what cultures do. They spread, and we learn from them as we advance in age. We learn from them. 
So the thing is, there's much to, to beautify our societies with. I mean, listen, how many grew up and they, they used to call us garlic munchers because we like to cook with garlic. I mean, look now, everybody has garlic in their food. Yeah, I think uh, the Mediterranean diet is probably the more, one of the more healthy things you could possibly eat. Yes. And again, that's another subject, too, that we're going to talk about is uh, your cooking. You've got two books out. Uh, you've got your first book, if I'm not mistaken, was out in 2012. It was no, no, 2014. 14. Places, that. The Journey of My Days, My Lives. Then you had a second one in 2015. Uh, seducing celebrities one meal at a time. Wait, is is a book something you kind of already had an itch to write, or was it something someone said, "Hey, you should totally write a book"? What was it kind of prompting it? Someone else. <laughs> I was writing short stories for the first one, so I would have a history of what I'd seen and heard, um, and that's where places is about. You know, just uh, all the places that, that I've been, and there are many. The seducing celebrities. Somebody called me and said, you should do a cookbook. So my manager calls me up and says, listen, we already have an offer. Would you do a cookbook? And I said, oh, so because I cook out of my head. You know, I'll open the fridge and think to myself, okay, what do I have here? So what do I eat tonight or whatever? But specifically when I have guests, now that's a different matter. It's like last night. It was like a five-course meal. Oh, my gosh. You know, so – and they're always surprised, which I love, uh, because I'm always surprised it turns out. Because to <laughs> me, you never know what your performance is going to be like that day. Just like you don't know, under the pressure of cooking for 14 people, how it's all going to turn out. And so, you know, I, 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 the main course was the filet mignon that I did with a black shiitake mushroom sauce over mashed potatoes that I had inserted, um, 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 what do you call it, uh, uh, now I'm forgetting uh, some truffle oil and and um, and then I did uh, a baked vegetable. Hmm. And I, I I think I've heard on another thing that you're you're very particular, obviously, about your food because, like you said, you wouldn't pair a baked potato with salmon because it's got to be it's got to complement, not overpower the main course. How much thought, like, if you're going to have a dinner party, how many days in advance do you start planning a menu? Probably two or three days. Um, I, I usually go because, you know, depending on how many people you have, sometimes I'll just have an evening during COVID. I only had four of us and we would meet each week and knowing each one was safe and we would have play a game of cards and I would cook dinner. But uh, but usually two or three days because, um, you know, it's it's uh, you know, it's not about it's not about being ordinary. I mean, I don't know why people eat so much fast food or they don't understand the food they're eating. It's. It's an, it's the nourishment of the body. It's it's it nourishes your spirit. It helps you understand, you know, the different cultures that have contributed to cuisines, and at the same time, it's it's a way of celebrating your day. And that's what why I like cooking because I always have people when they leave very happy that they spent the evening here, and that's my intention that when they leave, they want to come back. And I know uh, one of the great stories I was told that uh, one of your favorite guests, Doris Roberts, who I, I I'm, I'm rewatching Remington Steel at the moment on Amazon oh, Prime, and I is. love Doris so much. I would have loved for the chance to meet her, but evidently you said she was always very gracious and didn't want to mess up the table. It's this nice way you have it laid out. Yes, she used to come, but you know she, you know, the, let's face it, the host usually sits at the head of the table, right? Well, not this host. I just let everybody sit where they want to, but Doris. She would come a little early to make sure that that throne was hers. <laughs> so she'd always <laughs> sit at the head of the table and bring a bottle of Dom Perignon and say, open that champagne for me, will you? So she was kind of elaborate in many ways, but always appreciative. And um, she's dearly missed. She, uh, we also studied together. You know, I was in the class with her for 25 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so it was always great to see her do other things beyond the situation comedies or the drama of Remington Steele. Um, she would, you know, and do some Russian plays and the director used to get up on stage and push her hair straight back and have her redo the scene and give her a more severe or steer look. And Doris would come in, you know, doing Anastasia and, and she would come in with the cane and you wouldn't believe it was the same actress from, from uh, her series. So, 
she was always a surprise, very talented, but always nobody's fool and and nobody would disrespect her. She would she could annihilate you. I mean, she was that fast and sharp. But, you know, underneath it was a woman who wanted to be loved and she was dearly loved and um and those, you know, I look back now and all those people that were ahead of me in life have all gone now. And it's like, you know, you become you suddenly find yourself at the head of head of the, the line and um, all those great teachers. But because they resonated and because they were gifted and because they 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 were kind and also uh you know pretty solid in in their opinions of things but in the end they were well remembered and well appreciated because they're the ones you know the, our mentors in life that that shape our lives as well and so you become an example by the way you've lived and that's why I think it's important that, you know, I don't like young people talking to adults in a bad way. Mm. I'm part of the old school. I think if you don't understand the levels of society, then parents, they're denying their children that because they allow them to sit at the table and look at phones and read things. And, and no one's doing anything. I mean, when we sit around the table, a small group of us, we always hold hands and do a prayer in a sense because we always want to give thanks for what we've been given. And you know, that that has always stayed with me. That's why Thanksgiving resonates so well, because it's a time when America does appreciate its families and come together. And also, you know, in many ways, people you know, have lost a lot. I mean, this is life is not always, you know, uh, a bowl of cherries. Life has a lot of lessons. And um, if we don't overcome them or learn to overcome them, and that's why you must teach them from being when they're young, is to um, and be an example of, of uh, not lying and not cheating, but tell truths. Tell yeah. the truth, you know. It makes a difference, and that's why we have some wonderful human beings in this country. But uh, it seems to be the lies of life that seem to be dominating lately, because they keep lying, and people start believing the lies are true. And and I and I'm thinking, do your homework, read up on these people, and that's why. When I visit countries, you know, I have families who go overseas and they see if we see one more bloody icon, I'm going to scream. And I'm thinking, <laughs> did you study the icon? Did you find out what the icon was, its history and, and what it meant to the person who created? You know, there's always so many things to understand about everything, about people, about things that cross your path. That's what makes life interesting, you know, and that's what brings on your curiosity. And I think uh, it may have been Mark Twain who said the greatest cure for, I think, I don't know if he said ignorance or intolerance is travel because you meet people from other walks of life. You see how other people live in other cultures. And I think that's another thing we, you know, not to sit there and bash on social media, but it's also, like you said, the kids on their iPhones, they've got access to the world at their fingertips, but they never actually get up from their iPhones and go explore the real world. No, because they're given a short version of it. Yeah. And that short version is so quick, they expect life to be that way. That's why you see films these days. I mean, how many good films have you seen this year? I mean, very few. I mean, there's some good television shows, but after a while, it, it just runs the gamut. The things that remain are the things that and have longevity are the things that resonated. And, you know, uh, that's why I used to love the big, great movies, the black and white movies and and people want everything fast, and that's not the way we learned. No, exactly. Some of my favorite movies, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the, the Marx Brothers movies. Um, mm. One of my favorite movies is from 1937, Shall We Dance? And it's just that, that romance, the glamour. It's, it's, a, it's a complete, obviously, because we're almost 100 years removed from movies like that, but it's such a different world. And looking back, I, like, I can't get my 18-year-old niece to watch some of these movies with me, and I kind of feel like we're losing something. Yeah, well, you know, when we went to classes, the one thing we had to learn was that who came before us? Why is there a foundation, a history? Why do directors like Martin Scorsese and Spielberg restore films? It keeps the, the, the old movies alive still. And yet people, I say to, like, I had a couple of young friends, I said, have a look at this masterpiece called Lawrence of Arabia. The thing that came out of them, I thought, was, it's so slow. <laughs> So, you know, when you travel, everything comes into place. The education of other ways of life rather than just your own, because your own is really very limited mm. and myopic. 
So you learn when you come back, something about you will have changed by that journey. I don't care who you are. When you come back and you've invested in that journey, you come through that door home and you know when you have a quiet moment, something about you changed. And I don't want to keep you too much longer. I know we're enjoying this time together on a Sunday night. I wanted to ask if all the places you visited, do you have a favorite city, one that you, given the chance, you would always go back to? Um, I think Rome is one. Mm-hmm. I mean, every time you turn around, there's an art piece in front of you. It's it's about how people, how well they did things. Um, uh, in Greece, you know, it's it's kind of a summer playground, but there's so much more to Greece, and it's history. It's not just the ruins. It's the 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 history of philosophers and democracy. I mean, this is where the seeds were planted, and and how we're living today. Uh, Egypt, because of its constant contribution to art. Um, and and its mystique and its um, wisdom. Um, I love France. I mean, Paris was absolutely wonderful. Um, but, you know, there's some places that resonate, and the place that seemed to resonate with me is show me a nice ruin or show me a column, I'll tell you a story about it, and then just celebrate that event with, with a glass of wine or whatever you drink and, and dinner. I mean, those are the things that you remember well. You know, when you come back from a holiday, you're supposed to rest and be interested in things about yourself you didn't know and people cross your paths that you've never met and some stop, some move along. But, you know, some are just warnings, but they do come along. And if you're open enough, you'll be surprised who you meet. I mean, listen, when I was in Cairo, I loved the ancient part of Cairo, which is called Babylon. And I remember seeing... And being an actor, I thought, this man was very strange in his behavior. And he was just staring at me, wondering who I was. So I just stared back at him. And I thought, well, who the hell is that? And he kept staring. And, and I outstared him. And he got so uncomfortable that he turned around, lifted his jacket, and showed me his gun. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's the secret police. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, so there are certain games you shouldn't play, but yeah. uh, I can't help it sometimes. We can act, I'm investigating. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like we we could, like I said, I could have had you on for another hour talking about all these different subjects. I got to say, it makes me so happy that you and uh, Leanne Hunley are good friends off screen as well, because I love Tony and Anna together. Um, so that makes me very happy that she's attending dinner parties with you <laughs> in real no, life. Oh, yeah, she's she's wonderful. And if people want to keep up with you online, obviously, as I said, we'll have a link to the podcast, The Lost Treasure, is in the show notes. But if people want to find out more about you, about the podcast, everything, where can people go? Is there a website? Are you active on social media? Well, yes, I'm active on social media, on <clears throat> on Instagram, and, and uh, well, it's X now. I, I can't get used to that. No, I look neither. at that X, and it looks like a black symbol. At least when it was Twitter, it was a, a, you know, an innocent bird about to take flight. And it has an interesting symbol, but also um, Facebook. So I, I'm on those. So if people want to ask questions or or follow me in what I'm doing, um, because, you know, I'm hoping that this people will be interested in, in, in finding out what I found out about amazing treasures in this world and how people have lived and lived well and how people conquered and fought to save their countries. And, and you know, the the next phase, uh, I'm not quite sure what it's going to be, but, you know, I love love stories, and I'm thinking about the great love stories in the past centuries. Oh, so that might, be, that might be the next podcast project then? Yes. that I've got about four that I'm thinking about, and uh, but always interesting stories to me because I love mystery and I love love stories, and, and uh, I like a conquering hero and a damsel in distress, you know, all those things that bring your Romeo and Juliet to light. Fascinating. Yeah, and I can't wait to see uh, what you come up with next. It's always great to see you, whether you're on screen or I'm listening to your voice in a podcast. I appreciate your time. Teo Penglis, thanks very much, and hopefully we can have you on again soon. Thank you, and and thank you, everybody, for listening. Much appreciated. Of course. Take care. Be well. Take care. Bye-bye. There he goes. Uh, Such a great guy. What an amazing, uh, fascinating life. Hopefully we can get him back on again at some point to chat all about the stuff he's got going on. We're going to take another quick commercial break. We're going to come right back 
my interview with Sophia Lillis discussing her movie, The Adults, out on August 18th. You're listening to Geeks Me Radio. Please stand by. Hi, this is Andrea Romano. I happen to be the voice director for many animated series, including The Justice League. You are listening on Geek to Me Radio. We are back. I want to make sure we tell you about our official comic book sponsor, Bugs Comics and Games, on Bryan Road in O'Fallon, Missouri, easily accessible from either the page extension 364 or Highway 70. I was out there twice this week. I went out on Friday to get my... I haven't been out there since I first left for Terrific Con a couple weekends ago. So I wanted to get out there and get my new books. And then I also was out there today with my brother-in-law and his sons, my nephews, went out there to find some comic books for them because they're into Spider-Man now. They like the Hulk. They took them a huge poster uh, of the Hulk and Iron Man, and they had some comic books they got from the kids section. And I went home with a bunch of dollar books because I was going through just kind of, you know, looking through at my own pace. Found a bunch of Excalibur issues in the dollar box. And man, I love that comic. So I figured I'd get some more of those. If you are looking for old comics, new comics, something for the kids, if you're an adult collector and want something to add to your collection, a really nice piece like the first appearance of Craven the Hunter in the upcoming movie, it's coming out soon. You want to get books like that? Larry will help you out. Bugs Comics and Games is the place to go on Facebook. Give that page a like, and of course, check them out if you want to sell a collection, if you're looking to buy books, if you're wanting just to browse, get some uh, games. He's got a bunch of board games. He's got toys and action figures. He's got Pokemon cards and more, something for everyone. If you're a new collector, an old collector, a seasoned collector, someone who's wanting to get into collecting, Go check them out. Again, Bugs Comics and Games on Brian Road and O'Fallon. Very proud to have them as the official comic book sponsor here on geek to me Radio. My next interview, we did this back in June. I talked with, uh, I talked with Sophia Lillis, the actress from Dungeons and & Dragons and from Stephen King's It that was just out here uh, not that long ago. It seems like it wasn't that long ago, but wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey. Um, but I did this interview with June. I want to make sure I in, uh, express that because this was pre-strike. So she's uh, she's not doing this interview now. It's something we happened two months ago. But we had this interview, and she's got the movie coming out on August 18th called The Adults. She's starring opposite Michael Sarah and Hannah Gross. And we're promoting the movie even though, like I said, this was an old interview. So she's not violating any strike rules or anything like that in case people are wondering this was pre-recorded in June, but it's a great interview with a great actress. Here we go. Right now we're talking with actor Sophia Lillis. Uh, just been having a gangbusters past couple of years playing Beverly Marsh in It. Uh, now in Asteroid City as well. And of course, Dungeons and Dragons. New movie coming out, The Adults with Michael Sarah comes out August 16th. Sophia, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing well. I appreciate the time today. It's, it's uh, boy, when you look at the roles you've already had coming up, like we mentioned, Beverly Marsh and it, that st- iconic Stephen King story, uh, Asteroid City, working with Wes Anderson and that whole group of them, Jeff Goldblum and everything. And then the, the fantasy epic Dungeons and Dragons. It's kind of nice. You've got a little bit of everything, a little bit of horror, a little bit of drama, a little bit of fantasy adventure. When you're acting in roles, do you find yourself drawn to certain roles at all? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I always like to do play characters that I haven't played before, and uh, I always try to, because I, you know, I'm still learning, uh, I, I always try to take each job as kind of a learning experience, you know, um, what can I learn from this, uh, what's something that I, you know, haven't done before that I, I can gain from uh, doing this, this movie, and uh, uh, I always like to, I mean, it's, I feel like I've played a lot of characters that are, you know, um, not quite like me at all. Yeah. Um, but I think this most recent one, um, the uh, one I'm doing, uh, Tribeca for the adults, uh, I think is the closest um, to myself uh, as as I um, as I I've had before. So that's fun. And this came out, I think, if I'm not mistaken, from the Berlin Film Festival. Just did gangbusters there, and you know it's moved ahead quickly. Uh, when uh, I love hearing the behind the scenes stuff, talk a little bit about how you got the role of Maggie and what the audition process was like. Uh, yeah, I, I got it. Was actually a, a, it went together really fast. Uh, I was in the middle of shooting uh, the Wes Anderson movie, and uh, 
And I got an email from Justin saying, uh, the director, and saying like, hey, yeah, so uh, um, this is something that I, I think you'd be really cool for, and I really hope you, you're a part of it. And then Michael also sent me something as well. And um, and person, uh, another movie that uh, of Justin's, and I, I really, really loved it. And it's something that uh, I've always wanted to do, actually. I, I really love, uh, uh, I've always, thought it'd be so cool to shoot something uh you know based in new york um and uh, uh person person kind of i think did a really good job encapsulating uh, uh what it's like to live there and um uh the adults shot in upstate uh, so it's it, it, the closest i've ever been to to shooting in, in you know near my home and <laughs> um yeah it was just i said yes <laughs> and, it, and it's right out my parents and I, I went there, and uh, it was just it, everything kind of blended together <laughs> so so easily. Um, so uh, yeah, no, it was uh, it was uh, not a lot of you know trials and tribulations. It was just just kind of like a one and go situation. So yeah, that's always good to hear. And I, I kind of feel like I grew up <laughs> with Michael Sarah. Uh, from Arrested Development and then movies like Superbad and everything like that, Scott Pilgrim. Um, I've, I've heard in mm-hmm. real life, I've not had the chance to meet him, but he's he's just the super nicest guy. How was it to work with Michael on this? Oh, he's so sweet, so kind, very down to earth. Uh, he's just a, a simple family man, that guy. He's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's the sweetest. I can't think of anything, uh, uh, anything bad. I, I wouldn't say anything bad with right. this, but either way. There's nothing there. <laughs> so no no horror stories. He hasn't like he hasn't like sacrificed puppies on an altar for his acting horror prowess story. or anything like that. <laughs> no, absolutely not. No, it, it was so easy, but not easy, but it, it it was actually. It was it was so easy getting to know these people and, and working with them. Uh Hannah, Dustin, Michael, all of them were just so every single crew and cast member was like the sweetest group of people. Um and it was so nice to end the year off like that. Um, um, but yeah, no, it was it was so easy to to you know uh, get this relationship with these people and have this rapport and um, you know uh, be their sibling <laughs> in a way. Um, it it kind of it melded together really well. And you worked on so many great projects, both movie, we talked about some of your movie roles, but TV roles, like I'm Not Okay With This, Acting for a Cause, and everything like that. As an actor, I feel like, as a layman looking at this, they're a little bit of a two different beast. You've got the TV, which I feel might be a little more fast-paced than a movie. You're shooting this movie over possibly one month to three to four months. Do you have a preference working on the small screen versus the big screen? Not, not really. I think I, I really do like doing um, the smaller screens a lot uh because it's they focus on different things i think i think with the bigger ones they, they you know they're fun because you know they're you get to go to studios and and, and crazy sets and you know they have <laughs> the money to, to do that and it, it's all very you know uh but they you know they focus mostly on the shots the the action sequences the costumes and everything and i feel like with smaller uh um smaller screen movies they focus mostly on the characters and the relationships and uh there's a different feeling to it not nothing's better or worse but it is a very different um feeling and it, it's something that i really like to be a, a part of uh, getting to work on this especially after you know dungeons and dragons and west anderson they're great movies to be a part of but um uh this this movie just had a different feel to it and i really got to um no, it really gets to, you know, act as this, this character and, um, put a lot of myself into this role, um, um, from like being, instead of, you know, being like a, a tiefling character who's, you right. know, a demon like <laughs> creature <laughs> and so, uh, that's, um, uh, very similar to myself. And with a film like The Adults, you're, you know, you've got this sibling relationship. As in real life, we all grew up we're with our siblings all the time. We know everything about them. Was there anything that you as a cast or maybe the director had you do to kind of uh, do any bonding exercises with the, uh, with the people who are playing your siblings and family to kind of get you more in that mode? Or was it just he relies on everyone's acting talent um, and kind of takes it from there? Um, I, I, think, uh, I think Dustin does a really good job in just creating this very... Uh, uh, 
a very relaxing uh, work environment where it just feels like you're together, you're working together, and it's it's less of like uh, I have to find this relationship so I can you know do a good job, and it, it, everything's so easy uh, to talk to and, and be around. And um, I think the one thing that really uh, we also did in order to get to know each other, we had to you know create these voices and and. Uh, a lot of there's some dancing and singing in this movie, uh, uh, which you I think may see a little bit in the trailer. But uh, uh, so we had like a week prior to uh, create these characters and create these uh, these voices, um, and uh, in doing so, we you got to know each other. Um, and uh, so by the time we started shooting, we we already had this uh, this relationship. So um, yeah, that that really really helped. I know we've got a limited amount of time with you here, so my my last question before I let you go, throwing it back to Beverly Marsh, uh, Annette O'Toole famously played that mm. character as the adult Beverly in the original It with Tim Curry. I'm curious, when it comes to horror movies, what is it that frightens you? Are you more of a supernatural or are you more of a slasher kind of person? What kind of uh, horror movies do you generally enjoy watching as a fan? Oh, gosh. I, I don't really watch horror movies <laughs> <interesting> like that. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I, I like more supernatural things because uh, I feel like slasher movies uh, always feel like, ah, this really could happen, you know, <laughs> um, with, with supernatural, more, you know, ambiguous. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess if I had it, that would be the one. There you go. And again, The Adults comes out August 16th. You can catch uh, Sophia along with Michael Sarah in this movie, and I highly recommend you do. Sophia Lillis, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. There she goes. Uh, a couple of great interviews tonight. Uh, not uh, not that my interviews were good, but a couple of great guests. I think uh, Teo was great talking about his podcast, The Lost Treasures. And like I said, growing up as a lifelong Days of Our Lives fan, it was great to talk to him. Also, Sophia Lillis, you can check out that movie, The Adults, and uh, it would be a good one to go check out at your local movie theater. Get out there and see a movie. That's what I say. Uh, thank you, of course, to my sponsors, the City of St. Charles, Greater St. Charles Convention and Visitors Bureau, and, of course, Bugs, Comics, and Games. A couple of shouts out, too. Uh, we had an Alan... Alan, who was listening during Outdoors Dance, sent me a very nice text that he actually contacted management here about KTRS, about my show and how much he enjoyed it. That always means a lot. I always wonder who's listening, how much are they listening, so that Alan took the time to actually contact the people here at KTRS and uh, you know let them know how much he enjoys the show. That meant a lot to me, so thank you, Alan, for that. And Chuck Brinkley, uh, come to find out, you know, we're friends, but I had no idea. He said, yeah, I, I got your show on the iHeart Radio app, and I listen to it all the time. And I, that made me feel great, too. It always makes me feel good that people are enjoying the content I put out because you never know. You think people are listening, you see the downloads coming through, but finding out that people are listening and they do enjoy it, that means the world to me. So thank you, Alan. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, very kind of you both for those words. That's going to do it. Another show in the books. We'll be back next week to brand new guests to bring you. So make sure you check those out. I'll be at Toy Man Toy Show on August 27th. If you want to come out and say hello, we'll get some Geek to Me Radio stickers in your hand. Until next week, my friends. This is Geek to Me Radio. That's our show. Hey kids, are your parents about to buy you a shiny new toy from Amazon? Hi, I'm Chucky. Wanna play? Well, don't be selfish. Share some of that money with us. Before going on Amazon, make sure to type in bit.ly slash geek to me in the web browser. It will look just like Amazon.com, except it'll say referral geek to me radio up top. And then when you check out, a tiny percentage will go to support the show without costing you one cent more. So before your parents get you that gizmo, gadget, or widget, make sure they type in bit.ly slash geek to me in the web browser. Bit.ly slash geek to me. Bit.ly slash geek to me.